Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we check out that new Magura concept bike. Mokov helped the fight against the coronavirus. There's a new RockShox fork that's been lurking in the wild. And a copper donkey. Okay, so straight into news, and I'm gonna throw you over to Henry, who's got a very cool bike to talk about. So this week, we see the release of the new Transition Sentinel. Now, the old bike was cool. The previous generation was super, super cool. I remember lusting after one big time, but this one, if anything, looks even better. The lines of the frame are certainly slightly more angular, and the way it kind of cradles the shock, I think looks really, really cool. Now it's full carbon, again, 29 again. This time they use a premium Japanese carbon fiber technology, which Transition claim gives them the perfect blend of compliance, stiffness, strength, and impact resistance. So kind of hitting the holy grail. Also, it has a really cool feature. Now, one of the things they've done is really seized upon the idea of wanting to run the longest drop seat posts that you can for your size. So what they've done is running quite short seat tubes with very long insertion depths. If you were to buy the stock build for a large, which typically might come with 150, maybe 170 mil drop, this one comes with a whopping 210 mil drop. Even on the small, it comes with 150 mil drop. So I think that's super, super cool. The numbers are a lot more progressive than the previous generation, so no surprises there, with reaches ranging from 420 all the way up to 521. It's certainly a bit steeper in the seat tube angle with an effective angle about 78.2 degrees, and the head angle is a lot more raked out, running at 63.6 degrees. So I think it's a lot, it's a lot burlier of a bike the old transition, the old Sentinel was a beautiful bike, but it was kind of more of a um, more of a trail slash enduro bike. This one seems to be stepping in a certain direction. Something else I like about the bike is they offer it in two travel modes out the back, either 140 mil for a kind of a sprightly trail feel or 150 mil for a bit more big hit capabilities. Now, how do they do this? By a flip chip, you presume? Well, actually, no, what they do is they do it by changing the stroke of the shock. Now, this is really, really cool, and it's a great way to fettle with your bike at home, and it's great to see Transition kind of suggesting it right from the offset. Now, hopefully, I'm just waiting on some parts to come, and I can show you kind of a more in-depth look into this sort of thing in just a few weeks, where I'll show you my reactor changing the stroke from one length to another and kind of taking it in some different guises. Okay, so um, Kushkor have launched the bead dropper. So this is the bead dropper in question. It's basically a heavy duty workshop spec tire lever, but this one is designed around getting Kushkor on very easily. Uh, I quote them on saying, especially the critical step of dropping the bead into the rim channel. Now it retails for 20 euros and I think it's 1999 uh, pound sterling and US dollar, so pretty similar pricing. It's essentially a workshop spec tire lever, very heavy duty. Uh, the quality looks fantastic. I can imagine it's been really easy to use to get even the gnarliest like, downhill spec tires on. Um, and that's about all you need to know. Heavy duty. It does look a bit weird though, doesn't it? Hmm. Now, if there's one thing a comment section on the internet loves, it is unquestionably internal cable routing. People just wax lyrical about how much they enjoy it. Now, joking aside and sarcasm aside, I actually do love internal cable routing. I love the aesthetics. I don't find it a problem to live with. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Now, Magura a little while ago prototyped, you know, the next step, which is pretty much no cables whatsoever and no hoses. They do this using electronic gears, their electronic seat post, and now by moving the, uh, the kind of, what you'd normally find on the lever of the brake, internal of the bar, and just having the blades themselves exposed, they've almost got completely hidden hoses. Now they've done this by making a whole bike with musing bikes, which is a kind of a European frame builder, and it really does look fantastic. And there's a lot more refined version than we've seen previously. Before it kind of came out the fork steer, it didn't loop the loop and it was all everywhere. Now it looks really smart. So this full build of the cleanest setup I think you can get comes in at nine kilos, 20 pounds, 
and it also uses Magura's kind of coupling system. This is where you could basically unattach your caliper, lever, whatever you need to. Similar to, I think FSA do something similar on their hydraulic road brakes, and it's a really cool idea. It certainly means you don't have to you know, re-olives or if you've got crimped cables, or sorry, crimped hoses on the caliper end, then you know sometimes it can get quite expensive chopping and changing stuff all the time. I think it's great. It's great to see somebody pushing the boundaries and hats off Magura, I would love to run this system. Now, I was kind of poking a bit of fun earlier on. What do you guys think? Can you actually foresee a time where you would genuinely enjoy running a setup like this that might look fantastic, but might take a little bit more expertise, a little bit more time to get set up? I know I would. Hands down, I think it's great. But what do you guys think? Okay, next in news is uh, the Horizon range from Nukeproof. Now, although not that new, they have got a lot more stuff than many of you might have realized, um, including myself, to be honest. Now, I've had one of these stems for a while in 35 mil with a 31.8 clamp in this copper color. I, I think it looks amazing, and I know a lot of you have commented on my Instagram post about this color. It does look very cool. Uh, we'll get to the color in a minute, though, because it's a pretty good story with that. But what I didn't know is they're available in 35mm and 31.8 and the same with their new bars. So you can get the bars in alloy and in carbon. Now the alloy bars and carbon are available in the same specs, so 800mm and 780mm available in three rises. So this is the bars as you can see here and a few details for you to see. So they're available in 12, 25 and 38. Uh, these ones are the 38 and they're both the carbon ones in question here. Now the carbons themselves, the cool thing about them is they've got lifetime warranty on them. So this is really cool. And they also have a nine degree back sweep, but it's kind of cool because I like to roll my bars forwards and some people like to roll them back. They've actually incorporated a slightly forward roll on them uh, with the way they've given the back sweep. So it doesn't effectively reduce your reach, your cockpit reach by having that. Um, I've yet to try them, but it's a really cool concept. And I think if it just ekes out that little bit more space without having to roll your bars around too much, it's got to be a good thing. Uh, they've also got like a knurled finish on the ends of the bars and on the, basically all the clamping areas. And they use that super hardcore 3K weave on the end of the bars, the sort of bit that's gonna get damaged when you sling your bike down on the floor or you have crashes. Very cool looking bar. Yeah, lifetime warranty on carbon bars. I think that is exceptional. Um, good value bars as well. There's a whole range of other products. So on screen, you're gonna see a bunch of them. There's the headset, of course, really nice. This particular one has got those new tie bearings inside. So the bearings are ABEC 5 bearings, so they're really uh, industry standard bearings. You might have seen ABEC 5 in the skate world and various other industries. Now they're tie coated on the outside uh, on a molecular level, so it basically just means they've got a super tough finish and they're gonna be corrosion free. Uh, they also look really trick as well, if that's your thing, uh, knowing you've got something trick that's hidden on your bike, uh, but all in the name of uh, durability, which is great. And the same goes for the bottom bracket there. Something that's very cool that I haven't actually got on my reactor is um, a little upper chain guide. Now, we know, and I tell you quite often, that the, um, the narrow wide style chain rings, whether you're running Shimano SRAM or any other brand out there, they do work extremely well. But sometimes you do need a little extra protection, and sometimes just having a tiny little upper guide like this, I mean, it's featherweight, don't weigh a lot. In fact, what does it weigh? Let's have a look. It's sometimes just that extra bit of security that you need. Uh, it weighs just um, 38 gram, so not even a speck of mud on your bike. Uh, yeah, a really cool range of products, and they all come in loads of different colors. So here's a few of them on screen. Now the bars in the alloy version, uh, these are ones you want if you want to color coordinate, because they also do them in this copper color, which I haven't got a bit gutted to say, but I think Blake's got a set. So available in purple, red, blue, copper, black, and gray. Uh, the carbon bars, obviously, they're just available in that carbon finish. Uh, the rest of the range, again, in black, copper, blue, red, gray, purple. Um, really cool. They're also doing tube straps as well, which I didn't know they were doing. But what I did mention a minute ago when referring to all those colors was where the copper came from. Now, I posted this shot, in fact, on screen uh, of all of this stuff over the weekend because I was uh, pretty surprised when it all turned up. And someone commented, looks a bit like cash money. Uh, I think he was referring to the Kashima color by Fox. Uh, this is a very different color. It's a lot darker, actually, than Kashima. And I've actually got one of these stems on my new proof reactor anyway and it does look a lot different. It does go really well with it, but it got me thinking about where this came from. And then actually when he said that, I just got an email from Rob at Newproof, and he said it came from a copper donkey. Uh, this one, in fact. Uh, the copper donkey basically was a table decoration at his wedding, along with other copper color things. And it turned out that the designers at Newproof liked that copper color so much, that they thought, well, we can make a really good hand of color, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, they were right. 2020 has already been one crazy year. 
Coronavirus has obviously changed the world, really. I don't think there's anyone anywhere that hasn't been affected in some way. What's been really cool is to see companies, cycling or otherwise, help lead the charge against the virus. And this week, we've seen a really cool initiative from Mokoff as they have re-diverted their resources, their efforts and their expertise into manufacturing products to help fight the virus. So if you actually look at these pictures, you might recognize certain bottle shapes, certain products, and they basically tailored them as you know, antibacterial wipes, antibacterial sprays, and it's all going to the front line. So they're using the existing packaging to help do this. So I think it's really, really cool. Now they've done this in a couple of different ways. One of the big ones has been helping other companies that perhaps can make the antibacterial gels but had no way of packaging it. So teaming up with companies like that has helped them both use their resources more effectively. But I just think it's really, really cool, you know? Things like the chamois cream, which was already a great product, also has antibacterial properties. So it's just super cool. I think, um, you know, hats off to them guys and get in the comments. You know, you must have heard of so many cool stories from the cycling industry. Maybe get them into us and we can carry on featuring them because it's good to have some nice feel good community news in these tough, tough times. And just when I thought I'd uh, finished talking about Nootproof, I've forgotten. They've actually officially launched that ST version, uh, short travel, of the uh, reactor. So I've got the reactor, Henry's got reactor, I think quite a few of us got reactors. Uh, it's a 130mm travel frame that comes as standard with the 140, unless you have the, sort of the RS model which has a 150 fork on it. There's now a short travel version. Now I guess this was aimed at Sam Hill as his sort of cross-country bike. So it now takes the travel down to 125 at the rear and a spec of a 130 fork. So it kind of returns the angles. So angles are still similar, 66.8 uh, or 66.3, depending if you're running on rail or trail mode. Uh, the one you can see on screen is 4,900 pounds as you see it, but man, it looks fast. Uh, 28 pounds in a size medium. That is really respectable for a super burly short travel bike. Honestly, you can thrash the pants off this thing. Uh, in fact, even the launch video with Sam Hill on his own one could show you what the bike was intended at. If you compare it directly to some other 130mm bikes, it's a very different kettle of fish there. Now, I love the idea of this frame being so versatile. You can run it at 125 with 130 fork. I've got a coil shock on mine running 130 on the rear, but it feels more like 150. And I upgraded the fork to a 150mm 36 by changing the air shaft. It feels insane. It's definitely very, very capable. I'd love to know what the short travel one feels like by comparison. And I'm actually really tempted. I've been riding a cross country bike a bit, given the fact we're in lockdown, I can't really do too much in the way of off-road. So I've basically been doing like country lanes and stuff on my cross country bike. And I love the way it covers ground. Now I'm wondering if I can take those super light wheels off there, maybe even the Fox 34 that's on the front, I might need to bump up the travel 10 mil and then get a shorter travel shock on the rear. I might have a little cool project on the go there. And I know Henry's been talking about doing something similar, showing the versatility of the bike. But, um, well, there you go. Uh, there it is on screen. It looks awesome. Uh, back to you again, Henry. So just a few short weeks ago, we saw the release of the much anticipated and long awaited Fox 38. So what is the 38? Well, it's a ultra stiff, ultra burly enduro fork. So, Seemingly not to be outdone, RockShox have bought a new fork to the table, supposedly, or so the rumor mill says. Now we've seen some shots flying about on Instagram on Mitra Pilato and now Sam Hill's profile showing these new forks. So it's not a lyric, we know that much. The rumors say it's gonna be called the Zeb, although there seems to be kind of growing calls to resurrect the totem name, but it looks to be RockShox's answer to the 38. Now, speaking of Fox, just last week, I managed to sit down or Skype sit down with Jordi Cortez for an upcoming GMBN podcast. And we talk a lot about, you know, embargoes, these new forks, but also we touch upon at what point is the single crown enduro fork gonna be kind of not needed so much, you know? We're getting heavier, bigger tubes, we're getting heavier, bigger steerers. At what point are they gonna knock on the head and say, listen, just put a dual crown on it and call it a day. He was adamant that that day isn't anytime soon. And to be honest, for my own personal writing, it definitely isn't needed. But I think it's interesting, you know, aesthetics aside, is there any reason not to be running one of these big forks? 
But um, this RockShox certainly looks really, really cool. And for the Enduro racers, it's going to be much welcome, I imagine, to keep up with their Fox racing counterparts. <laughs> Okay, now it's quiz time. I'm going to ask you three questions. You're going to rack your brains to try and answer them. Um, hopefully not cheating using your phones. This is all about seeing what general knowledge you have. Uh, and then Henry's going to give you the answers later on in the show. Okay, so first question coming up on the screen right now. What is Oakley, as in the eyewear brand, what are they named after? And what, for an extra point, was their first product? Mm. Okay. Next question, number two. FSA make wheels, they make a number of things, but what does FSA stand for? And question number three. What tyre company is leading the charge with their use of graphene in mountain bike tyres? Now over to Henry for some bike cave action. And now it is time for bike cave. So if you've got your own submission, get it into the GMBN uploader and hopefully we can feature it on the show. Now, something a little bit different this week, I'm gonna throw you over to our very own Blake as he talks us through the grand designs he's got for his bike game. Hey, how's it going, Doddy? Dude, I have been so busy. Do you know what? There's some benefits to this lockdown. I get to stay at home and I get to pimp out my garage. Take a look at this. I got inspired by you guys on GMBN Tech with all your bike cave entries. I've been looking through and through your, those uploads. Man, it's so cool what people are doing to their bike space. Now look at mine. Look at it. I got cupboard. This is a little wardrobe right here. Quick run through. It's full of tools already. I'm still in the process. I am doing a full Blake Builds series on GMBN where I'm going to take everyone through what I've been wanting to do in my garage throughout how I can have a space for me and my bikes. Now, in one of these episodes, I'm gonna be building some bike storage right there. But let us know in the comments. Actually, Dottie, I need your help as well because I don't know what I should do. Should I treat the worktop because this is scaffold boards? Should I put a clear varnish on there? I don't know what to do. So I need your help, Dottie. I need some more inspiration because I don't know what to put. Yeah, shelves or another unit like this. I don't know, but this is a work in progress. And this is just a glimpse of what's to come on GMBN. See ya. I am pretty chuffed with it though, Doddy. You should come around. You can do some tech show in here if you want. Oh, let me get building. Okay, now it's time for Rewind. This is where we go into the archive of mountain biking to find out where all the cool stuff you're riding now started. Uh, obviously, it had to start somewhere for it to progress into the rat sport that we have today. If you've got anything old or you know anyone that's got anything old and retro, uh, 90s era would be the best, even earlier, even better. Um, we'll take some early 2000s stuff, uh, noughties there. But anything you have, send it in. There's a link at the bottom of the uh, screen there, and there's also one in the description underneath that you can click through. Send it in, we love it. Okay, so first up this week, wow, this one's from Ian in Grand Junction, Colorado. I picked up this mostly original 1985 Mongoose ATB for a song. Um, although it being generally well looked, up, looked after, I gave it a good tune up, put a new freewheel on it, some fresh grease on the canty posts, and with a fresh pair of Tamil Panarasa Pasala tires, uh, and some Crank Brothers double shot pedals uh, that I use for everything. It's ready to hit the bike paths. I'll tell you what, look at that thing. Looks rad. What happened to mountain biking in the middle? So when mountain biking started, they had long chain stays, they had slack head angles, they had short stems and big wide motocross style bullhorn bars. And then at some point it went all cross country with short top tubes, long stems, narrow handlebars. Bizarre. Look at the thing, it looks rad. Fully polished frame. In fact, it looks really similar, um, but a lot nicer to my original 24 inch wheel Peugeot Lynx. I had the same sort of thing, long chain stays, slack head angle, big bars, short stem. In fact, I bet a lot of the parts on that are very similar to what I had. Uh, I bet it's got like lychee cantilever brakes and stuff like that. Man, that looks awesome. Great to see. Thank you for sending that one in, Ian. Next up's from Andy in Cumbria with his orange uh, MR8 Pro. 
Uh, yeah, rad. You've got the green Michelin tires on there. So when they first came out, their first orientations alone, uh, of those were called uh, Wild Grippers, uh, affectionately known as Wild Slippers amongst uh, those that rode them um, in certain conditions. They were kind of terrifying, which was strange actually, because they also had the Cobb 16, which is still one of the best downhill tires of all time. It was later released as the DH16. I think they also had the Transalp. I think that was a 24. Uh, I might be wrong on that, or a 32. I lose track of all the numbers over the years. Of course, Michelin are back big time at the moment with their new tires that Sam Hill's riding. Um, look amazing, but I love them the green. They do look cool, even though they might not have been cool back then. Uh, Reynolds 853 tubing. I love the retro bike sticker there on the top tube. Mate, it's looking rad, that bike. And there's a big sort of rock shocks, something or other in the background there on your bench. You wanna get a shot of that, mate? Um, another orange in the background there, is that a Patriot? Could be a Patriot, look at that pivot point on there. And a Trek as well, that looks like an Eeb. Very nice, nice selection. Hope green stem, hope green brakes, very nice. Mr. Andy Turner, great selection you got there, dude. Awesome to see. Okay, next up is from Brett, and he says, uh, the Stingray was my first bike, and this is it. <laughs> look at that, so cool. And the first real mountain bike was this Cannondale. Oh, look at that, rad. 1998 Cannondale Super V400. I always wanted the early one, I forget what it's called, maybe it might have been 300, and it was all red. I think I wanted it because it was team colors. Cannondale, very clever like that. They launched a base model in the team color, then they had a few others. Uh, everyone knew were a bit more expensive, but if you didn't have the money, you'd always wanted one that looked a bit better than it was. But man, look at the thing. I think this was a later one though, because it had the low pivot rear end. The one I was after had the like the cantilever style rear end, just a single pivot, kind of like an, an orange back end really. Very simple, but it had the head shock on the front there. And I think it had the curved fork rather than the straighter one that you've got on yours. But really nice to see. They're weird looking frame design. They're kind of, the more you look at them, the worse they get, but then you glance back and they kind of look really nice again. Bizarre how to do that. I've always loved Cannondale. Make some cool bikes. No way, look at this one. So this one's from Paul in Harrow. Harrow's my hometown, and it's a Quest mountain bike. Without even reading this, to tell you a, bit, a little bit of a story. So I used to work at the bike shop in North Harrow, 511 Pinner Road. Uh, the phone number was 0181 427 as far as I remember. And um, I actually went back there last year when I was at a friend's wedding just to visit the shop and uh, met the owner, Malcolm Fryer. The shop is still running, it's still making good money. I was so pleased to see. Malcolm taught me so much back in the day. I started there by doing work experience and then um, after school work and stuff like that, building wheels, well, lacing up wheels and doing various other bits, making all the cups of tea in the world. And I loved working there, taught me so much and those guys are a great team. Um, so this is a 1992 Quest. Supplied by the bike shop that he worked in as a teenager, bike shop in North Harrow, and it's even possible he laced up the wheels for me. Dude, it's entirely possible. Um, oversized aluminium frame imported by Malcolm and sprayed in a pseudo Klein blue pink colour scheme. So that would have been painted by API Resprays, that's Andy Palmer International, I think. Uh, it reflects the oversized Cannondale stroke Klein style of the time. Yeah, it was, those frames, they sold loads of those frames with that oversized look. Um, oh, so good to see. So uh, inch and a quarter threaded headset. Yeah, I remember that, so the evolution size. 150 mil stem, 560 bars and onza bar ends. Dior XT 3x7 group set, XT hubs, later Mavic 231 rims. Originally with Panaracer tires, um, and now you've got Richie Z Max on there. Saddles are Rolls leather and original SPDs, which I still use. I'm a roadie at heart, so until last year, this was my only full mountain bike. Wicked, so still been using. Uh, still been using the thing. Oh man. Paul, thank you for sending this in. This is really cool to see. I remember the, I, everything about it, I just remember. So cool, look at those dummies there. Yeah, I'm loving the paint job. So yeah, you can see there that it definitely is a bit of a linear fade style mock Klein paint job. I'd love to know if I actually did the, build the wheels for that. That'd be so cool. Wow, do you know what? That's one of the best ones for a while. I'm um, just gonna hit you up with one more actually. This is from Chris in, um, in the bike, is uh, Valici. Now this has got a really cool story. So uh, Dave Cullinan won the World Championships uh, 1992 at Bromont on one of these. But he was sponsored by Iron Horse at the time and it didn't make a full sus bike. Now he, uh, the rumor, he rode one of these in the pits at another race and was literally like, oh my God, this is amazing. He rang up Iron Horse and was like, get me one of these and I'll win the World Champs. And he did. 
How cool is that? And, and even cool is the way that he actually, uh, it, it probably wasn't the thing that actually made him win the race, but everyone noted the fact that he jumped the bridge. So the cable car, it went up, there was a bridge, and he timed in between the cable car seats, he timed it so he could gap the bridge like a tabletop. And apparently that's what gave him the real sort of lurch of speed to get through that finishing line fastest. But his run is on YouTube somewhere, you can find it, but that famous jump isn't there. And you know, I've never seen a photo of the actual jump in a race, and I don't even know if it exists. If anyone knows, uh, put a link in the description below, I'd love to know, but that is one of the most legendary moments in mountain biking. And there's the bike, um, much duplicated bike. A lot of people ran those, Diamondback ran them. I think, to be honest, I think most brands rebadged those. And in fact, the bike shop I used to work at in North Row, they sold these as Quest as well. That's how popular they were. Everyone used to do them. Wicked bike. Oh, look at the thing. Tiny little shock on it. Single pivot, high pivot. Can you imagine how badly that thing pedaled? Woohoo! <laughs> Wicked. Thanks for the memories, guys. See you next week. So now it is time for the quiz answers. So the first question in regards to the origins of the name Oakley. Well, James Jannard started Oakley in 1975 and he named the company after his dog called Oakley Ann. The first product was some grips before later on moving into eyewear. And the answer to the second question about where the Italian manufacturer's FSA name comes from, it is of course full speed ahead. And the final answer is of course Vittoria, who are the cycling industry's number one consumer of graphene. Now they use it to not only make their tires more resistant to damage, but also harder wearing, so win-win. And that is us all done. Thank you very much for watching the GMBN Tech Show. As always guys, don't forget to get in the comments and let us know what you thought of some of the tech we featured on the show. Please do like and subscribe to support the channel and we'll see you next time. Thank you.